and you're very welcome. This is The Beautiful Truth on BreakForNews.com with Fenton Dunn reporting. Thanks for joining us for this, the fifth in our series, 9-11 Deja Vu. 9-11 Deja Vu is a persistent, nagging conviction that simply won't go away, that those responsible for 9-11 have yet to be brought to justice. And the purpose of these audios is to educate and inform in pursuit of that objective. Now, uh, this isn't exactly material that you can rush out and start talking to everybody about. I'll say that up front, because uh, we're dealing with some serious topics here. In diesem Audio untersuchen wir die Beseihungen zwischen dem Wirten Reich und 9-11. Es ist ein Warning an uns, dass unser Feind von nichts halt machen. In this audio, we will examine the links between the Fourth Reich and 9-11. It's a warning to us that our enemy will stop at nothing. I'd like to read you something before we begin because really it's the entire purpose and objective of the audio. The quote is this. The enemy has only images and illusions behind which he hides his true motives. Destroy the image and you will break the enemy. That was spoken by the teacher to Bruce Lee in Enter the Dragon, 1973. 1973, we'll be going back to that era. I'll read that to you again. The enemy has only images and illusions behind which he hides his true motives. Destroy the image, and you will break the enemy. And that is my objective today, to destroy the image of the enemy. I'll say something which uh, I said in a previous audio, or make a similar reference yet again, that here we are now on the fifth audio examining the 9-11 issue, and we're not dealing with space beams or uh, thermate or any of those kinds of issues. We are still five audios in now working on the issue of motivation. Motivation is key. And before going rushing down into the minutiae of 9-11, it's absolutely essential that we understand the motivation. And when it comes to motivation, context is king. And the bigger the context, the better the picture you get. So it's not about a narrow focus on the uh, political events immediately surrounding 9-11. That won't give you that big picture. It's about something much bigger. In part 1, 2 and 4, I introduced the issue of Wall Street and the role of Wall Street in 9-11, giving some of the backstory in parts 1 and 2, and then in part 4, tying together some of those dots to show the Wall Street apparatus as an essential part of the structure of the cabal against whom we are waging an undeclared war of the people versus the elite. I pointed out that the economic and financial structure is at least as important as the military structure. Indeed, that's always been the way it has been. If we look at the uh, rise of Hitler, the people of Germany being used by those in power in order to achieve their objectives. and. I have a great deal of sympathy for the German people because they were used by this cabal in just the same way as the people of the United States are being used right now. Anyhow, the point I'm making is the lure for them of a baby boomer generation in the United States coming to peak earning capacity and offering them the opportunity where they in control of the United States of uh, using that people to power their objectives. And hat tip to uh, Hawkwind in the forum, by the way, for helping me to uh, get a focus on the importance of that issue, that uh, the economic events we've just seen uh, were a raid on the baby boomer generation. And as I'm saying now, that that baby boomer generation were destined to become the stormtroopers of uh, their push for power. So we've been extending out the context to see a plan which came out of London and Washington and New York, which was known to the public as Reaganomics, Thatcher, privatization, and all that financialization of the economy. And so what we're saying is this financialization was an essential component, the economic component, which matched the military might, which these people could also deploy. Deploying the military might of the United States, of the people of the United States, in as ruthless and amoral a fashion as they deployed the economic might of the people of Germany during World War II. You might say, well, okay, I can see the usefulness of, indeed, perhaps even the vital necessity of having a huge 
economically powerful structure behind you but that still doesn't say to us that the people on Wall Street and in certain very big financial institutions that doesn't prove to us that those individuals were cognizant of 9-11 perhaps had advanced knowledge of 9-11 and were working knowingly to a particular agenda it could just be that those people on Wall Street were given a green light to create certain structures but were nevertheless not cognizant of what was happening. Well, I think the analysis that uh, I'm going to bring forward here will establish clearly for you that there was cognizance of what was happening and that cognizance definitely extended into Wall Street. So now I'm going to take a key and I'm going to use that key to unlock a door. And when you open the door, you will look out on an entirely different world and the image of the enemy will have been destroyed. We're going to start with a key player on Wall Street and also in the political system. A key player whose name you know only too well. A guy called Hank Paulson. You know, when you're doing research, and uh, I do an awful lot of it, uh, you go through an awful volume of information. But sometimes it's just the one nugget of information that really helps to bring something into perspective. Sometimes it's just one tiny piece of information like a thread coming out of a knitted jumper. And when you pull on that, everything starts to unravel. And Hank Paulson, in this case, is that thread. So let's pull on the thread of Hank Paulson. Do I have to remind you that he's a former chief executive of Goldman Sachs? Do I have to remind you that Goldman Sachs made $3 billion betting against subprime, even as they were selling subprime products to their customers? They were simultaneously betting that these subprime products would fail. And I don't think that you would be under any illusions in relation to uh, Hank Paulson. The centrality of Hank Paulson to what's happening in the markets, his central position that he played in those events around the bailout and around the collapse of Bear Stearns and Lehman's and the key and vital role he has been playing. Paulson is uh, yet another one of those uh, Wall Street boys who moved from chief executive of Goldman Sachs, indeed uh, his three predecessors moved like Hank Paulson from Wall Street and into the political structures of the United States. He was, of course, appointed by uh, George W. Bush back in May of 2006 as uh, Treasury Secretary. That's Hank Paulson. So why are we looking at Hank Paulson? I'm going to quote you from the online biography, public domain stuff, and 99% of what I'm going to talk about here today is in the public domain. It's not stuff that you have to go to uh, tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy theorists to find out it's part of the historical record. So here, from the historical record, is the biography of John Ehrlichman. Let me just read it to you. Ehrlichman worked on Nixon's unsuccessful 1960 presidential campaign and his unsuccessful 1962 California gubernatorial campaign. He was an advance man for Nixon's 1968 presidential campaign. Following Nixon's victory, Ehrlichman became the White House counsel later replaced by John Dean. He held this post for about a year before he became the chief domestic advisor for Nixon. It was then that he became a member of the inner circle of Nixon's closest advisors. He and a close friend, Haldeman, whom he met at UCLA, were referred to jointly as the Berlin Wall by White House staffers because of their German family names and their penchant for isolating Nixon from other advisors and anyone seeking an audience with him. Ehrlichman created the Plumbers, the group at the centre of the Watergate scandal, and appointed his assistant, Eagle Krog, to oversee its covert operations, focusing on stopping leaks of confidential information after the release of the Pentagon Papers in 1971. Henry Paulson was John Ehrlichman's assistant in 1972 and 1973. Well, hello. Isn't that an interesting piece of information? Hank Paulson worked for John Ehrlichman, Nixon's black op boy. Doesn't he have some backstory, eh?
It's the sort of stuff isn't talked about a great deal, although, to his credit, without expanding on it to any degree, Paul Krugman in the New York Times on October the 15th, 2008, became aware of that because it came up in a TV documentary, became aware of that fact and reported on it very briefly in a, a little blog piece called Nixonland and subtitled Meet the Old Boss. And uh, Paul Krugman wrote, there are all sorts of connections between the Nixon administration and the Bush administration. But here's one I didn't know about. Hank Paulson was John Ehrlichman's assistant in 1972 and 73. Maybe you have to live through Watergate to know what that means, wrote Krugman. And left it at that. I don't know why you left it at that, Paul. You could have gone on. You could have gone on. You could just could have kept pulling on that piece of wool and kept unraveling the image of the enemy. I don't know why you stopped there. And if Hank Paulson is working for John Ehrlichman, then he's on the inside track of everything that's going down among that cabal wrapped around Nixon always remembering as well that Tricky Dicky Nixon was a protege of Prescott Bush. And there's an infamous photo, it's on the forum on breakfornews.com, of Prescott Bush, that's George Bush Sr.'s father and George Jr.'s grandfather. Prescott Bush standing, gazing at Nixon uh, with uh, admiration, the sort of admiration you have for, uh, let's say, a statue that you've carved. And he's adjusting Nixon's hat. And Nixon is standing there like some uh, some little boy who's just run an errand. <laughs> yeah, Tricky Dicky was Prescott Bush's protege. Now, uh, Prescott Bush has gained a certain infamy because of uh, persistent reports about Prescott Bush and his role in funding Adolf Hitler. Let me uh, briefly digress here to also remind you of the uh, Nixon policy of opening up relations with China that was rolled out by Nixon. And of course Hank Paulson, been Ehrlichman's assistant, would have been uh, an intimate part of that and that probably goes some way to explain Hank Paulson's approximate 70 or so trips to China down the years and he's reputed to have extensive links into uh, the Chinese establishment. And uh, the reason I'm bringing all that up is because I'd like to remind you that within weeks of 9-11 taking place, China was uh, to very little notice, because people were really looking in other directions at the time, was quietly admitted to the World Trade Organization within, as I say, weeks of 9-11. Anyhow, I just mentioned that in passing. We've connected some of those dots in previous audios. But, uh, so where are we headed with this? Let's just refresh our memory now. So we're talking about Hank Paulson, who was a key architect of that farce uh, which played out at the time of the bailout and the time of the economic system began to uh, collapse. We've got Hank Paulson linked right back as an assistant to John Ehrlichman in Nixon's administration. Now, Nixon's administration is infamous for issues like Watergate, but it should be infamous for other stuff because, as I say, Nixon was a protege of Prescott Bush. Prescott Bush has been implicated in funding Hitler. And now let me read you another little fragment about Nixon which uh, tells you who he was, who he was in its full technical or detail, and uh, you don't need to know this, but I'm going to have to tell you anyway. It comes from an article called The Power Elite and the Secret Nazi Plan by uh, Dennis Cuddy. And I'll just read you this brief extract about Dickie Nixon. And he's been around a long, long time. A vice president before he was president, of course, in the 50s. But he began to enter politics no sooner had the dust settled on World War II in 1946. In 1946, writes Cuddy, Richard Nixon ran for Congress. And his law firm, Bewley, Krupp and Nixon, received a $2 million fee from Romanian Nikolai Malaksa, which helped Nixon get elected. Malaksa had been a business partner of Hermann Goring, head of the Nazi Air Force, and worked for the Gestapo before setting up a company in Nixon's hometown of Whittier, California, according to John Loftus and Mark Ahrens in The Secret War Against the Jews. Uh, I don't know about that Hermann Goring link. Uh, certainly it's in the record that uh, Malaksa 
who gave money to Richard Nixon to kick his political career off in 1946, that Malaxa certainly had links with Albert Goring, uh, Herman's brother. But Malaxa is very dirty. Now we're linking Richard Nixon, in whose administration Paulson had played such a role with uh, the Nazis. Let me read you something else to flesh out this guy Malaxa, who was putting money into Richard Nixon, as I say, just after the end of the war, in 1946, when Nixon ran for Congress first. I'm going to read you from the Reading Eagle from uh, 1952, I think. And uh, the Reading Eagle has got a dynamite little piece. It's up on uh, Google, where they have archives of newspapers. I'm going to read you this. When Judy Copeland, the Justice Department G-girl, was arrested in New York during her date with her Russian diplomat boyfriend, she had in her purse certain confidential FBI-CIA reports, one of them pertaining to the famous Romanian Nikola Malaska. This confidential report showed that Malaxa, once a businessman in Romania, had various business dealings with the communists. Despite this, Malaxa is now on the list to get a special bill passed by Congress giving him permanent residence in the United States. How Malaxa is able to rate this special pull with Congress remains a mystery, but it probably stems from the fact that he's been able to retain some of the most skillful lawyer lobbyists in Washington, because this is a person who has sent presents to Communist Premier Anna Pauker of Romania, and most amazing of all, has been able to get $2.4 million out of Romania from the Communist government. This $2.4 million was payment for Malaxa's factory, confiscated by the Communists. Ordinarily, Communists don't pay people for factories they confiscate, they just take them. Meanwhile, this column has obtained a copy of the confidential report found in Judy Copeland's purse when arrested. Dated May 11, 1948, and written to J. Edgar Hoover by Alan Orr McCracken, Acting Director of Central Intelligence, essential portions of the report read, During 1937, Malaxa began his collaboration with the Nazi regime in Germany. He established close relations with German industrialists, including Albert Goring, the brother of Hermann Goring. Malaxa gave Albert Goring an interest in all his companies, including the Rosita Iron Steelworks. About the same time, the subject began to subsidize the Romanian Iron Guard, a fascist organization. So that's Nicola Malaxa. He and we are now knee-deep in Nazis. I don't know if you've noticed that in the last few minutes. And uh, I'm going to try and provide context for all that a little later on. But right now, just let's keep pulling this thread because it's leading us from Hank Paulson to Richard Nixon. And once we get to Richard Nixon, we are, as I say, starting to get knee-deep in Nazis. Let me just continue reading you something from Dennis Cuddy. Alan Dulles, and Alan Dulles interjecting, was, of course, uh, CIA supremo Alan Dulles. Alan Dulles and Nixon worked together, and in 1947, when the OSS was being transformed into the CIA, Henry Kissinger was Dulles' translator and later President Nixon's Secretary of State. The next year, 1948, in August, President Harry Truman adopted National Security Council Document Number 20, which included Operation Bloodstone. This operation lasted from 48 to 50 and brought Nazi collaborators to the U.S. as intelligence and covert operations experts, according to Christopher Simpson in Blowback, America's Recruitment of Nazis and its Disastrous Effect on Our Domestic and Foreign Policy. Simpson continued, some of these Nazis eventually became U.S. agent spotters for sabotage and assassination missions. The men and women enlisted under Bloodstone were not low-level thugs, concentration camp guards or brutal hoodlums, at least not in the usual sense of these words. Quite the contrary, they were the cream of the Nazis and collaborators, the leaders, the intelligence specialists and the scholars who'd put their skills to work for the Nazi cause. Regarding the CIA's work with Nazis, John Loftus in The Muslim Brotherhood, Nazis and Al-Qaeda revealed that many of the Nazis he had been assigned to prosecute when working for the U.S. Attorney General were on the CIA payroll. He found this information literally buried in U.S. government vaults underground in Suitland, Maryland. In those vaults, Loftus also found the CIA 
had volumes of files on the Muslim Brotherhood, a fascist organization that was hired by Western intelligence and that evolved over time into what we today know as Al-Qaeda. And so it continues to unravel. Dot, 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 start connecting them up. Taking us from Hank Paulson to Nixon to Prescott Bush to funding for Hitler to Malaxa who seemed to have uh, magic powers and deep intimate relationships with both communists and fascists and also to Alan Dulles and to that uh, OSS uh, wartime intelligence agency being transformed in peacetime into the CIA and taking us also into that relationship between the Galen, the German intelligence service during the war, Hitler's intelligence service. Uh, maybe Hitler's intelligence service is the wrong choice. Hitler always a stooge. Hitler uh, reminds me of uh, Richard Nixon in a way, in that both of them were being used by other people. An essential component, you need a guy to go up and front up the operation. But Hitler always uh, being used by other people. Uh, a, a vehicle for their ambitions but uh, so it's better to say uh, not uh, Hitler's Galen but really the Nazi Galen organization would be a better description of them and uh, links between the OSS and the Galen what's that you're saying <laughs> yeah links between the two opposing supposedly intelligence services between the intelligence service of the US the OSS and the Nazi intelligence service the Galen and then we see that leading us into the issue of the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, which was an operation in, into which the Galen had deep tentacles. So those tentacles were acquired in this uh, meeting. I suppose you could call it merger, really, between uh, the OSS, which became the CIA, and the Nazi intelligence operation. And so that's where Al-Qaeda come in, and that's where 9-11 comes in. Um, this material can be a little bit intimidating if it's the first time you've ever encountered this sort of material. But believe me, these connections uh, between the German intelligence services and the uh, OSS, which became the US intelligence services, and also the issue of what happened to the SS elite and their departure to South America, all that kind of stuff has been examined before. But it can, as I say, be a little intimidating if it's the first time you've come across it. So, uh, so far all you know is that suddenly you're up to your ass in Nazis, left, right and centre. What does it all mean? Well, I'll start to, I hope, uh, bring all the pieces together in just a moment, but we've got to take a break for music first. But let's take a break for music first. And as I say, uh, this can be intimidating, but don't be intimidated. C'est possible travailler ensemble pour vaincre ce cabal mal parmi nous. We can work together to defeat this evil cabal. Nous appartenons ensemble. We belong together. This is Gavin de Graw, and we belong together. And you're very welcome back. This is The Beautiful Truth on BreakForNews.com with Fintan Dunn reporting. Okay, I'm going to give you some more material and then we'll, uh, using those dots, we'll start to tie it all together. And uh, I'm going to quote some more from uh, The Power Elite and the Secret Nazi Plan by uh, Dennis Cuddy. And I'm not endorsing uh, that take by Dennis Cuddy. Cuddy, in many cases, is in fact just simply pulling together information which uh, other historical analysts have gathered and presenting it to you uh, in his particular context. So I'm, I'm, I'm not endorsing some, all or any of this. What I'm saying is that there are historical, unarguable, historical facts dealt with in uh, in what I'm about to speak about now. And so let's just take a look at some of those facts. We know from Hugh Thomas, who wrote The Strange Death of Heinrich Himmler, that the Red House Report, as it was called, disclosed that Heinrich Himmler commanded the finances of the Reich, one of the great bargaining tools of the 20th century. He was in a position not only to negotiate the Reich's future, but also his own survival, ready to engage in final discussions with Allied intelligence. Himmler assiduously arranged the transfer of a huge chunk of Nazi Germany's assets abroad, and his long-term aim was to reinvest this capital and expertise in building a new Fourth Reich that would arise phoenix-like 
from the skeleton of the SS state within a state to be governed by a hard core of the elite. In March 1942, the U.S. Attorney General's office revealed that next to the Rockefeller stock in Jersey's Standard Oil Company, the second largest shareholder was the Nazi-controlled IG Farben, which was, by the way, broken up by the Allies after World War II into subunits, a huge industrial conglomerate. Building on this, Nazi party head Martin Bormann, working with Himmler's SS and others, initiated Aktion Adlerflug, or Operation Eagle Flight, using stocks, bonds, gold, etc., to create or control corporations in Portugal, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, Turkey and Argentina. According to Paul Manning, a CBS journalist during the World War II events, in Martin Bormann Nazi in Exile, Martin Bormann utilized every known device to disguise their 750 corporations and the ownership and patterns of operation by the use of nominees, options agreements, pool agreements, endorsements in blank, management contracts and others. In other words, creating a confusing network of control, of business control, which would disguise the uh, actual controlling interest in this, in this network. A primary destination for the Nazi underground, and by the way, that, that kind of stuff is exactly what Wall Street does so well, isn't it? Options, nominees, pool agreements and all the rest of it, yeah. A primary destination for the Nazi underground was Argentina, where one would think denying the Nazis' communications with their contacts there would be important. However, according to Glenn Yadin and John Hawkins in The Nazi Hydra in America, President Truman's chief science advisor, RCA Chief David Sarnoff, at the end of World War II, approved of RCA through its subsidiary Transradio, maintaining a radio link between Buenos Aires and Berlin for the Nazis. That sounds like facilitation and collaboration, doesn't it? Sounds like that to me. Let's turn our attention now to Alan Dulles. Alan Dulles, who worked with Dick Nixon, by the way. According to Hugh Thomas, again in The Strange Death of Heinrich Himmler, Dulles had spent many years cultivating important social and business contacts in Germany. As a young lawyer, after the First World War, he joined his brother John Foster Dulles at Versailles, where they advised on war reparations while spinning simultaneously a web of business connections, Hugh Thomas asserted that beginning in March and April of 43, Dulles's assistant von Gravernitz began meeting in Switzerland with Himmler's emissaries, as did British agents. Right? So this is now in 1943, when the writing is on the wall already for the Reich. You have meetings taking place in Switzerland, where uh, Dulles is posted as uh, the OSS man on the ground in Switzerland, OSS being the predecessor of the CIA, and begins then a series of meetings at a high level led by contacts between the intelligence agencies of Great Britain, the United States, and the Nazi intelligence service of uh, General Galen. So beginning in March and April of 43, these meetings, and the plan called the SS Solution was that Hitler would be put under house arrest in Berchtesgaden and a de facto government under Himmler's control would take over. It would end the war with the West and then would concentrate on defeating the Bolsheviks in the East. So that was the, uh, the motivation uh, at a national interest level, so to speak, for holding these meetings to see if Hitler could be overthrown internally in Germany and uh, a new realpolitik emerge. However, the danger was that now you had, and of course you had financial interests involved like Rockefellers and Rothschilds involved in the war effort and profiting off the war effort, that you now had a series of very high level meetings taking place which may have laid the groundwork not for the terms upon which the Great Reich experiment would end but instead the basis upon which it would go underground. After the Nazi surrender in May 45 Brigadier General Reinhard Galen and his top aides were at Fort Hunt, Virginia on September the 20th, making a deal with the OSS head Bill Donovan, Wild Bill Donovan and Alan Dulles for them to use the Galen organization operating out of Pulak, Germany. Part of the deal called for the Galen in 10 years to become the what is now West German Federal Intelligence Service, the BND and Galen operatives served in that 
intelligence operation, the official German state intelligence operation for decades. The Galen started with about 250 Nazi intelligence agents and later grew to about 4,000 members. The CIA and the Galen cooperated on a number of ventures and early training occurred at a camp in Oberammergau where Private Henry Kissinger was posted during World War II. Kissinger, we know, was mentored by Nelson Rockefeller, who had uh, very good terms with the Nazis and, and other fascists, while at the same time David Rockefeller was on friendly terms with the communists. Anyhow, thus began operational cooperation between what had previously been the Nazi Galen Intelligence Service and the CIA and British intelligence. In 1953, the Galen operation helped the CIA to overthrow the Mossadegh government in Iran, installing the Shah as the leader of the country instead, uh, along with a, a Nazi collaborator, General Fazola Zahedi, as Prime Minister. Zahedi then signed a 25-year lease on 40% of Iran's oil with three American oil companies, one of which was Gulf Oil. The inevitable thrust of these events can also be seen in uh, George H.W. Bush, who was uh, in all likelihood a, an OSS agent in World War II. In the 70s, Bush was a US ambassador to China and later as president he uh, supported the most favored nation trading status for China. And of course we have also detailed uh, Nixon's role in so-called detente and opening up with China and also Hank Paulson's uh, 70 or more trips to China. So essentially the uh, the remnants, if you want to call them remnants, uh, of the uh, Nazi intelligence service because uh, remnants implies that there's only a few diehards left. But uh, this is looking a, a lot more like, well, in fact, uh, all the most capable members at a technocratic intelligence and scientific uh, level uh, were actually preserved. But you have got the, uh, as I say, the remains, shall we call them, of the Nazi Galen operation uh, collaborating and cooperating on joint projects with the uh, OSS which was then to to rename itself the CIA. In John Loftus's book The Muslim Brotherhood Nazis and Al-Qaeda he writes that the Muslim Brotherhood became a secret arm of Nazi intelligence and uh, Loftus seems somewhat surprised that at the end of World War II, instead of prosecuting the Nazis, the, the Muslim Brotherhood Nazis, the British government hired them. They brought all the fugitive Nazi war criminals of Arab and Muslim descent into Egypt. And for three years, they were trained on a special mission. According to Loftus, what happened was that the British sold this network, this Arab Nazi network, to uh, their buddies in the OSS, which became the CIA. Loftus says that during the 1950s, the CIA evacuated the Nazis of the Muslim Brotherhood to Saudi Arabia, where some of the leading lights of the Muslim Brotherhood, like Abdullah Yusuf Azam, became teachers in the madrasas, the religious schools. And there they combined the doctrines of Nazism with this uh, weird Islamic cult, Wahhabism. And in these schools was a young student who paid attention and Azam's student was named Osama bin Laden. In 1979, the CIA took this Arab Nazi network out of cold storage and in an arrangement with the Saudis funded them and brought all these Arab Nazis together to ship them off to Afghanistan to fight the Russians. Uh, when they'd finished fighting the Russians, do you think they just gave them a few books and sent them home? Or do you think they continued to preserve this rich asset, the Muslim Brotherhood asset, which had morphed into Al-Qaeda. Of course they preserve the asset, and that asset is now and always has been under the control of this deeply troubling network with tentacles all over the planet. So what picture emerges then if you start to connect all of these dots? And I've just laid out some of them, and you can Google any of the stuff that I've talked about today and you will find reams and reams of material because this is stuff that has been written about but what we're doing is rather than as I say minutiae of 9-11 we're looking at the big picture so what's the big picture which these dots enable us to show 
Well, the big picture is, as we know, anyhow, World War II was a staged event, and the German people were being used in just the same way as the American people are being used right now, by a cabal interested in power and in money and in war as a tactic to pursue their goals. And when the uh, charismatic stooge Adolf Hitler had outlived his usefulness to them, they were plotting with the enemy to dispose of him as easily as another stooge, Richard Nixon, was disposed of in the Watergate scandal. The big picture that emerges uh, implies that we, we lost so much during the course of World War II when this network, operating under the exigencies of war, which uh, gives you license to do things that would not be possible in peacetime and gives an operation uh, an opportunity to consolidate power and to manipulate power in ways that are not possible in peacetime, that essentially that was when it all really went badly, badly wrong for us. And that at the end of World War II, rather than having defeated the Nazis, they had simply shucked off the coat, which was the German people, which they were wearing. And the operation became international in scope, with operatives and agents internationally in China, in Russia, all over Europe, in South America, and of course with these people already starting to move their stooges into place in the uh, US political apparatus within 1946 Malaxa providing money to uh, Richard Nixon and with the hand of Prescott Bush all over this with Henry Kissinger deeply involved in these events at an early inception period the, the critical period here is we're talking about from 1943 to 1948 when, uh, with the world in tatters, these people had ample scope to dictate the shape of the post-World War II world. The big picture which emerges is that elements of our own supposedly democratic Western governments, freedom-loving Western governments, <laughs> have been in close collaboration with that ruthless scientific and technocratic elite which powered the rise of Nazi Germany, that they have been in cahoots with them, an enemy among us all these years. The big picture shows us their capability. It shows us that a guy like Hank Paulson, whom was part of their operation, working for Ehrlichman in the Nixon administration, hand-picked Nazi connections left, right and centre, that Hank Paulson is in place at that critical moment to steer events on their behalf at the time of the economic crisis. That shows you their operational capability, folks, that they have their boy at the top of the world's most voracious uh, investment bank, Goldman Sachs. And by the way, don't buy that it's all about Goldman Sachs. That's part of why there's a, such a, a focus on Goldman Sachs right now, is so you won't think about JP Morgan, which works hand in glove with the Fed, right, and others. You're being uh, invited to focus only on Goldman Sachs in the same way that you were invited to focus only on George W. Bush, the idiot son, during the course of the Bush administration. It's much bigger than that. But uh, anyway, as I say, the big picture is one where you have to take on board that this structure, which was established in the period 1943-1948, that that structure has the operational reach to place one of its own boys in the US Treasury at the critical moment. That shows you that this network, born in the years around the end of World War II, still has operational capability. The big picture that emerges enables you to put the assassination of John F. Kennedy in a context, that it matches in, in some way the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo, the assassination which triggered off World War I, that the bullets which rang out in Daly Plaza on that day were the first shots in an undeclared war on freedom, your freedom, my freedom, and the freedom of people all around the world. It shows you that the invasion of Iraq, Iraq won by George Bush Sr., not long after announcing the New World Order, was the first test campaign, their first deployment of military forces in pursuit of their objectives in the era of Thatcher, Reagan, Bush. The big picture which emerges paints the 9-11 event in a chilling light. It shows us that 
pleased with the success of their first large-scale military deployment, they proceeded on to the second phase of that military campaign. And the attacks on 9-11 were the trigger for that new phase. The big picture which emerges also shows us that by the same token this uh, structure is not omnipotent because we are now standing with the debris of the failed economic structure all around us. This was a structure which they had to put on, as I said in previous audios, an economic structure which they had to put on crack cocaine in order to try and give it enough momentum in order for them to achieve their military and strategic geopolitical objectives. But one which they overcooked and it blew up on them. They knew it was going to blow up, by the way, and we'll, we'll cover that maybe in subsequent audios, the exact methodology of the economic collapse. But they knew it was going to blow up, and so they deliberately triggered it at the exact perfect moment, just as the Bush administration is going out and the Obama administration coming in, so neither of the two notional political establishments of Republican or Democratic in the USA have to take the hit or responsibility for it that it's uh, shared out equally. These people are not invincible. The big picture also shows us the uh, role of the G8 in all of this because this network has, as I say, tentacles internationally in the intelligence services in particular of the key G8 nations. And so the G8 as an institution was largely dancing to their uh, agenda in the period of 2001 to, say, 2006. But you've also seen since then as their economic structure came off the rails and as the the scam they have been running left, right and centre on everyone came into full view that, uh, that the political control which they have even over the G8 countries uh, is beginning to lose power and there is a fracturing of the cohesiveness which they had in the early opening stages of the campaign in uh, 2001 post 9-11. So uh, it's starting to come apart on them economically and politically. Also the big picture that emerges is that despite those trips by Paulson to China, the 70 trips or more that he took, despite Richard Nixon's courting on behalf of this cabal of the Chinese with his opening up China gambit and George H.W. Bush's uh, similar work in terms of opening up to China, which means forming an alliance with the cabal in China, that despite that, the Chinese recently at Copenhagen told this cabal who stood to profit so much through their Wall Street uh, tentacles from the uh, global warming scam, told them to get lost. So despite all that contact with the Chinese, right now it seems that, as I say, not only is their, their G8 political infrastructure starting to come apart at the seams, but China, India, Brazil, South Africa, etc. are working against them, and working against them openly at the moment. A lot to take in in what we've just covered, folks, uh, especially if you're new to it. I know some of you are not new uh, to the uh, Nazi material, but uh, we've been trawling a lot through the past in order to get context. And you see how far back we've had to go to give ourselves, finally, I think, the full context which embraces the uh, G8 structure, the New World Order, uh, Wall Street, and shows how 9-11 then fits into what I say is, is a ghastly picture. But that's the past, and they are the past. And we are in the process of expunging this evil. And we are in the process of burying the past. Because these people have been waging war on the boomer generation, on the inventiveness and ingenuity of the boomer generation. The purpose of these audios, as I said uh, at the beginning, is to educate and inform. Because first, you must know and understand exactly who your enemy is in order to defeat the enemy. And the greatest asset which these people have is that there is not a broad realization of their operation. The asset they have is propaganda capability which has been trying to pull the wool over the uh, eyes of the people of the United States in exactly the same way as they did the same to the German people at the time of World War II. So it is that concealment which is their greatest asset. And in the Internet era, concealment ain't as easy as it used to be. You never, ever 
would have found out this kind of stuff prior to the arrival of the internet. That's a game changer, folks. And that dynamic is ongoing in the 21st century, which wants to expunge and bury these demons from the past. Mes amis de la resistance, my friends of the resistance, laissez-nous travailler ensemble pour vaincre cette cabal mal. Let us work together to defeat this evil cabal. Nous appartenons ensemble. We belong together. Let's nous travail ensemble. Let us work together. Let me return to uh, what I quoted you at the beginning of this audio in uh, Enter the Dragon. The teacher speaking to Bruce Lee saying, The enemy has only images and illusions behind which he hides his true motives. Destroy the image and you will break the enemy. I hope we've gone some way to destroying the image of the people who have been paraded in front of you as leaders, financial and political, in recent events. And also, I hope we've illuminated the 9-11 event for you in a meaningful way. I uh, would also like to remind you that it's only with your support that we continue to do the work here that we do on BreakForNews.com. Your support in the forum posting, your support by endorsement silently reading the material because we see the page counts uh, on the uh, forum threads in the Break for News forum. We know that a lot of you are reading this material and taking it on board. I hope that you are putting as much effort into circulating the material to others who aren't aware of the analysis on breakfornews.com. Remember, we did out a whole heap of websites in 2005 as being controlled by the CIA stroke uh, international compromised intelligence services and so they're not going to tell the average alternative reader on the internet about breakfornews.com it's up to those of you who are on the website posting on the website reading the website to spread the word about the analysis we're doing here we also of course can only continue this work with your financial support and there's a paypal button in the forum and on the home page of break for news okay that's it for this edition I'll be back soon with more and I hope you can join me for that but in the meantime for breakfornews.com this has been Fenton Dunn reporting <laughs>